Ladies and gentlemen of the YouTube's esteemed colleagues, uh, and and to everyone else listening, I uh, I have a confession to make. I I I'm enjoying working with Sketchbook Pro recently, uh, and uh, it's actually it's quite a handy tool. I'm gonna what this video is. Uh, I'm, I'm going to dig really deep into it. Actually, I don't know. This is the first time I've ever used Sketchbook Pro. Uh, Autodesk contacted me and requested that I put together a uh, an illustration using uh, their software. So that's that's what we're going to do. So buckle up. That's that's the journey. That's the intention of where we are going today. And uh, this is a long one. This is a long video. We're looking at about 45 minutes. So strap yourself in, grab some popcorn, maybe uh, load up some Sketchbook Pro of your own. Uh, I think you can head on over to their website, and I'll put a handy link in the in the um, in the ex the text description below. So you can just zip on over there, pick yourself up a copy, and you can draw along with me. Um, it's going to be a fun one. I, you know, at first you saw me kind of doodling around trying to explore some, um, some kind of a theme. I didn't know what to do. I kind of drew this big guy. <clears throat> I knew I wanted to do something. This had to be non-IP, and you hear that term sometimes. I've worked in comic books and video games for a long time. IP means intellectual property. So, like Star Wars is an intellectual property or an IP. Star Trek is an IP. Uh, you know, Mario is an IP. It basically it just means a brand uh, or a universe that is. It's it's a, a sort of a generic business Hollywoodish term for uh, what you know, a property or a a, a universe, uh, a fictional universe kind of a thing. So they wanted something that was non-IP, basically just meaning don't do anything that's owned by anybody. Uh, it has to be something completely new. Um, so I can't ever use these characters for anything ever again, which is a little sad because, you know, it's tricky because you want to put something, you know, you want to create something very inventive, um, and that inspires, like, I like to draw, when I draw, I like to tell a story with everything. So it's sort of like saying, Hey, well, we want to buy a little story from you. Um, and I'm totally cool with that. Uh, you know, but it's it's not easy to do because you have to detach from it. You have to make something that you're that you love and that you you could see yourself doing a lot more with, but then not do anything more with it. Who knows? Maybe something more would happen with this. But anyways, uh, I, at first I was playing around with the idea of like, uh, oh, I saw at the Chronic Tacos that I go to, uh, which is a taco place nearby. They had like a uh, a bunch of like Mexican bandito kind of posters. And I was thinking of doing like a robot, a robot bandito kind of a thing. And, uh, and, and I thought that would be cool, but maybe, I, I don't know, maybe I want to do something like that later. So I don't want to spoil that. So I thought I'd just go with like something kind of sci-fi and, uh, and, and not really too logical in terms of the design, just something designy and fun and, and pretty and, 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 uh, uh, Yeesh, I just keep getting messages. Sorry about that, guys. I shut all that stuff off. We're good now. Um, so yeah, I wanted to do something um, kind of shiny and pretty and uh, something also, uh, you know, when I was first doing the um, uh, the character design that was kind of the big guy in the background, um, you know, I was thinking like that, that could really appeal to like uh, boys or it could appeal to myself, like, you know, uh, but it's, it sort of excludes uh, a lot of people who might be interested in using the software. So I was thinking a lot about like, you know, what kind of a, a thing do I want to represent um, that also fits really well into what I do well. Um, you know, I kind of have a little bit of manga influence in, in my work, but I mean, you could say that, but I sort of, I mean, I, I watched a lot of that kind of stuff, you know, growing up, but also, I mean, I've been drawing this way similarly to this since 1994, 95. So um, for me, like all this is really just kind of like my own comfort zone style, which I think is the best place to go if you've got a high pressure kind of a job to do, you know. And that's what this one is, you know. This is a <clears throat> sure I, I enjoy doing it, but this is a job too, and I gotta I gotta be professional about it. 
And that means I've got to uh, draw for the audience. I have to think about like who's going to be watching this. You know, what kind of things might they like? And uh, let's see, Guardians of the Galaxy just came out, so it's like you know, sci-fi is kind of doing this big thing right now. I love, always love sci-fi. It's really neat to see, um, you know, some cool sci-fi stuff happening in films and on the uh, more of a mass media kind of a level instead of it just being like this little niche kind of corner of nerddom where only only the most brave nerdliness will go. And, you know, that's that's where I was before. But now, um, you know, it's totally cool to be that that level of nerdliness. So uh, this one's for you, bros and, and sisters. Anyways, I don't know if that's the right term. Broettes. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, bromadillas. Anyways, uh, so... You know, I thought sci-fi would be a fun place to go. I, I, I really, I don't know if you can tell, I really love sci-fi. And I want to do a kind of a sci-fi thing in my own kind of a style. It's it's not commonly done this way. So um, anyway, it's got a unique flavor, and I thought I'd run with that. Um, you know, she's got like this cool uh, techie kind of a device in her cyborg or cybernetic uh, enhanced arms. Uh, it's kind of a little bit of a throwback to the old uh, 1980s airbrush cyborg. Uh, kind of girls that you would see the sexy pinup cyborg girls that were all airbrushed and I don't know the artist's name I'm a little embarrassed to say that I don't know the artist's name that sort of popularized that in the 80s but uh, you know I used to have those on my like trapper keeper artwork <laughs> and uh, I don't know, do people still know what a trapper keeper is um, but anyways uh, are all those old folders you know that had that kind of airbrushed art on them that influenced me so much in the 80s and uh, so it's kind of beneficial to have seen I mean I don't know if you guys watch a lot of sci-fi movies but man if you go back and watch like the old uh, uh, original the uh, Alien uh, and I actually liked Aliens as well uh, James Cameron um, um, you know, really kind of like uh, it shaped a lot of my youth with uh, some of his movies in the 80s. Uh, some of the kind of sci-fi. I love Prometheus. That was really cool. Guardians of the Galaxy is so rad. Oh, man. You guys see this movie. So cool. Uh, just like fun. It's just a fun sci-fi romp. You know what I mean? Uh, but a really actually moving story as well. And, you know, there was a time when you couldn't have a talking raccoon in a... Uh, in a, in, a, in a Marvel uh, uh, movie that just was not like a popular kind of an idea. When I worked for Marvel uh, back in the early 2000s, uh, they were somewhat opposed to these sorts of kind of things, you know. Um, but anyways, so basically I'm, 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 the, the point that I'm getting to is that sci-fi is freaking rad. It's freaking rad. And, and uh, so <laughs> I wanted to do something that was kind of fantasy sci-fi and uh, so this guy he's maybe he's like a cyborg he's got like a big massive glass bucket of a helmet and uh, I'll always love that kind of a thing uh, if I could ever find an old style space helmet I'd, I'd love to just to have one um, you know from like the old 1950s or 1960s bubble helmet kind of a thing I love that that era of sci-fi it was really fun really sleek uh, ship designs and things like that. Um, but I like to kind of add a little bit of a modern flavor and have these massive tubes kind of hanging off of them everywhere. Maybe they're, I mean, it's, it seems like he's got a breathing apparatus on, but then in, inside of that helmet, he kind of has like this, uh, uh, plate kind of a thing for a face. And what that could be is, uh, like, uh, that he's more, uh, cyborg, not human, but some kind of living, entity that needs a certain kind of a um, atmosphere to survive and all of these uh, cybernetic enhancements and and breathing apparatuses in order to <clears throat> in order to breathe uh, you know whatever his atmosphere is uh, what I'm using for the tool here is actually uh, it kind of looks like an old uh, uh, pencil kind of a, a brush uh, if you were to look at the actual brush shape you know I, I like to keep that paint open the 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 brush paint because you can adjust things like um, you know if we were to, to dig into some of the features of Autodesk that I learned whilst doing this piece um, you can make adjustments to the brush on the fly uh, what you just saw me using was a little bit more of an, a sort of a loaded oil brush and if you look at the big fat brushes that uh, kinda have a, a black paint on them in the in the brushes um, 
you know, that one, I don't think they have names, but anyway, that one is, um, uh, it kind of comes loaded. And what that means is it's more like a real paintbrush. If you were to dab it into uh, a color of paint uh, and then streak it across the page, eventually it's going to run out of paint. You know, towards the end of the stroke, it'll run out of paint. And that's kind of neat because then you can kind of do a dry brush kind of an effect where you're uh, sort of smearing things around, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, which kind of allows you to blend a little bit, which is super neat. That's one thing I did really like about using uh, uh, Sketchbook Pro is that you can blend really easily. I think this is a fantastic sketching tool. Um, it actually, I don't know that it's faster than anything else that I use. Um, but it's it certainly like it gets a very natural feeling sketch approach and I know a lot of guys use this uh, software for tablets if you have like a Cintiq Companion or if you have like a um, uh, I think uh, Asus has a uh, has a tablet out now there's a lot more tablets that are happening that maintain the pressure sensitivity uh, that a Wacom can support and Sketchbook Pro is really great for that. I know that some people actually use Sketchbook Pro on their iPad with a, one of the specialized Wacom pens that they have um, and it's it's I haven't used it like that yet before. I'm actually drawing this on uh, uh, both Windows and Mac and that's the neat thing if you do buy it like Sketchbook Pro is a fairly affordable program if you're if you're wondering about like cost and like how you can use it like it's both Mac and Windows, you know, which was super awesome. I got a I got a copy of it for I, what I thought was just Windows. I started recording and then I was like, you know, I kind of want to take this on the road because I've been doing this after hours, <clears throat> after my normal workload, and uh, so I wanted to kind of chill at a cafe. So I just loaded it onto my MacBook and uh, and it worked very smoothly, very effectively. You'll see later in the video that you the user interface changes in scale because. Uh, what you're watching right now is uh, I did the preliminary sketch stuff in on a 30 inch Mac display and then later I switch over to um, or actually it's on Windows but it's on a Mac display and then later I switch over to my MacBook Pro which is just a 15 inch MacBook Pro version so uh, the user interface is going to change in scale but anyways um you know the brushes themselves some of the things that I learned about them uh, I really liked using the the pencil brush and then adjusting. You can change the size with a heavy pen pressure and then the the size with a light pen pressure and then you can change the opacity depending on how hard you press as well. And then you can change whether it's like a square, or, you know, hard edge or soft edge. What you're seeing me do right now is like there's some neat tools that allow you to sort of set up mm, kind of guides or rulers so that you can draw like perfect ellipses and then I, I flubbed that I didn't do a great job with that so I'm still learning <laughs> I'm still learning how to use this software um, you know it, it it's really kind of a, a, a pleasure to try new software all the time um, and as I was saying like I was kind of trying to see this I wanted you guys to see how how I would approach it um, and and or I kind of wanted to see for myself how I would approach it completely blind you know I didn't really watch any tutorials a friend of mine was telling me halfway through the piece you know it was like a weekend and then I went and hung out with a friend of mine and he was telling me that there's ways to create like pattern brushes and um, create interesting uh, kind of uh, patterns and and things that I didn't even I, I know nothing about I know that there's a there's a way to utilize like a, a color layer kind of a thing which I did not do I'll explain how I handled color uh, when we get to that um, right now, I'm, I'm really just kind of focusing on line art stuff. Uh, my background is in comic books, if you didn't know that. Um, and uh, so clearly, uh, you know, that's kind of how I'm drawing that. That's how I'm approaching this, like a comic book artist would. Um, you know, and, and actually, I think if I were doing, if I were a young man, just starting out doing like maybe a web comic or learning to draw comics, I think that I, I would probably go with something like this. It's a lot less messy than the way that I was doing it back in the 90s. Um, you know, I had a, just tons of paper everywhere. It was very expensive. You know, you go out and you buy a case of uh, Bristol board, 11 by 17 Bristol board, uh, which is how comics were drawn uh, back then. 
and uh, you know that alone would cost you ten bucks. You know, that's in the '90s. Then with inflation, that'd be like the cost of this software for just a, a pack of like you know 28 pages or 30 pages of Bristol board. So to do one comic, you know, you have that's not even including ink and crow quills. We used to use these uh, crow quills that you can simulate now using something like Sketchbook Pro. But uh, yeah, check out Sketchbook Pro. Go to their page. Support this software, man, because they're making some neat, neat stuff with this. And it's probably one of the best for its affordable for its affordable price. Like as you can see in the drawing, I'm getting a lot of versatility out of it. This is um, as powerful as a sketch tool. It's as powerful as anything else that I've used. Um, and I'm, I'm familiar with uh, Photoshop and Corel Painter, and and I use those on occasion uh, for a lot of my work. Um, ultimately, it's what it's going to boil down to for good software is going to be affordability and versatility. Um, uh, you know, if you've got layer effects. If if you look down in the bottom corner, you've got layer effects that you can use. Um, you can import your own shape for a brush, which means that if you wanted a brush that was a bunch of trees and you just do one brush stroke and you create a whole row of trees you can create a brush that does that with uh, sketchbook pro um, you can do you can space out that that pattern whatever that pattern is if you want more of a chalk kind of a brush you can get a chalk kind of a brush uh, if you want to flatten it out and kind of do like a chisel brush you can do that uh, there's color blending options with the, the, the brush color function functions that you can edit and alter. Uh, you can even has a randomize element so that if you want something that has a little bit of a jitter or something where you'll get a little bit more happy accidents, you can get that from this software. Super efficient. Um, also, you know, uh, there's a, sim a symmetry feature, which I didn't use in this drawing, but I love the symmetry feature because when you're drawing faces kind of straight on or whatever, really neat for getting like this. It's it's drawing you draw on the right side or the left side or whatever, and it mirrors it onto the the other side of the drawing. Really neat. Um, you can rotate that or whatever. Um, cropping um, and and scaling, uh, making selections and uh, resizing them fairly easy. Although I my pipeline got slowed down a little bit because I'm used to using quick keys and uh, you know control T does nothing here uh, you have to hold down the space bar and kind of rotate the whole image um, using that way like when you when you press the space bar a menu sort of pops up where the icon is and that allows you to scale rotate etc you know that sort of stuff um, yeah, so that took a little bit of getting used to, uh, but rotating the canvas was super efficient. If you if you noticed a few times in this drawing, I've sort of uh, just kind of, you know, you press the space bar and by dragging out uh, and then selecting that and then rotating, you can, you can actually rotate the whole image. Um, I think uh, transformations are handled the same way. Uh, rescaling the entire canvas was a little bit trickier. I did find that I found a sort of almost a max, a maximum size for what my computer could handle. It started to slow down when I started working at like 6,000 pixels, um, which I think that's really excessively large. But one thing that Sketchbook Pro does is it sort of forces you to do to work with somewhat larger brushes. So it's more, I would almost say, sketchbook tool and painting tool. Um, I don't know about, well, you could do a lot of industrial design type of stuff too with the ruler functionality and things like that. I don't tend to use rulers. Um, you know, but if you're using an actual, like you could actually have like a plastic ruler on your, uh, on your Wacom <laughs> if you wanted to. It might actually be faster, I'm not entirely sure, but I think you can create interesting custom curves as well uh, if you use that. Uh, some of the the um, the layer features are also really neat. Uh, you can do like a multiply layer. I think you've noticed that I've been using multiply for a lot of the, the grayscale, uh, which creates like, uh, you know, that's how you're going to get that like shadows and stuff like that. And also you can increase saturation. It's very similar to the multiply, you know, multiply uh, in other software such as 
um, Painter or Photoshop. Um, as far as like the design goes, let's talk a little bit about what I was thinking, what I was doing. Um, these are just alien plants. Um, I like designing alien plants. It's one of the things I would love about doing a sci-fi world is that I think it would end up feeling like almost a blend between fantasy and sci-fi. And some people categorize those as the same, but you know, I, I, I just like whimsical far off places and I, oh gosh, like Ah, in Guardians of the Galaxy, they had, sorry, I just watched that this weekend, so I'm stoked about it. Um, they had like a, instead of a planet, they had like a hollowed out head of some ancient alien being, and they were mining the brain matter and tissues, and I was like, oh, that's so brilliant. And it's almost fantasy, you know what I mean? Um, so I love that realm, I love that kind of thinking. I was so envious that they got that, they got to that idea first, I wanted to do something like that because that's, that's sort of the way that I think. I don't know. I would want to combine a lot of these sort of uh, untraditional science fiction things that you would do and uh, take fantasy elements and blend them into that, like creating really just weird plant life. And uh, if you're watching this in sequence, I guess this would come right after, uh, possibly soon after my Metroid piece where I was like kind of creating some weird spiky alien plant life as well. Um, even though technically I drew those these two paintings three years apart, no, that's the beauty of time lapse and uh, an internet and <laughs> video. <laughs> um, so, but uh, getting back to the point, uh, love creating little science fiction. And there's my signature. You can see. Oh, here's I'm doing some transformations and stretching and kind of rotating. Um, so I love doing kind of science fiction stuff. We're we're uh, we're reaching the part here in the drawing where um, I'm kind of wrapping up a lot of the line art before I go into color. Um, but yeah, as far as the idea behind the characters, I was thinking, uh, because I, I tend to write a story as I, as I uh, progress, as I create. Uh, oh, I was trying the, uh, I'm going to get sidetracked here, explaining some things about color. Uh, I tried the marker tool. There's like a loaded Copic marker tool. And uh, it works really neat, although I found that uh, I, I almost think that if I were going to use that, it would take a little bit of adjustment to get it into my process because it multiplies every time you lay it down. So if you were to do a different color on top of that, it would do something like uh, it, it would multiply that. And sometimes I just wanted the color that I picked, you know. Um, and you'll see what I mean later as I transition through a few different methods of coloring. Um, but yeah, as far as the idea for these characters, so I, I, I wanted to just create a, um, <laughs> what I named it while I was drawing it was uh, Hannah Solo. It's just like basically like a female space adventurer. She's not part of some organization, although she has a uh, little badge on her shoulder that sort of implies that maybe she's part of not law enforcement, but some kind of a group. Uh, you can see it there on her shoulder of her of her short sleeve jacket, um, you know. And and I think in terms of story, I just wanted her to feel like sexy and sleek and kind of have some not generic sci-fi things, but like that like kind of hanging belt buckle and and she's got a couple of little gizmos and contraptions for uh, you know surviving the wilderness of space you know what I mean and uh, the implication is that yeah she's like an adventurer she just like kind of travels around maybe she's got some ship and this is her bodyguard this is her muscle um, whatever he is and with him I just wanted to create a little bit of a mystery uh, one their size uh, I think actually the the difference in, in their, their kind of body mass and what they are really kind of adds to, that makes them more dynamic, that they're not just, you know, two chicks, you know, like floating through space, two chicks on a mission in space. Um, it's not like that sort of thing. It's, it's like maybe there's a backstory between these two characters, you know. Um, maybe, uh, you know, he was being oppressed by some kind of empire and she rescued him. No, that's, the, that's Han Solo and Chewbacca. Um, <laughs> um, I'm Kashyyyk. Anyways, ah, super Star Wars nerd. Uh, so maybe their story is, is something else. Maybe their story is that, uh, you know, uh, 
maybe he's he's busting her out of prison and uh that's why she kind of has like you know cyborg arms maybe she was actually like you know in this kind of a realm instead of instead of uh just uh imprisoning you they actually like remove your arms and so like maybe he built these arms for her maybe something like that i i in the uh in the kind of character design uh, i had kind of come up with this idea that he was sort of a beekeeper and that's what those things are the uh the floating i you know floating camera looking guys they're sort of like the, he would shoot those out of his cannon and then he has these huge uh, rotary kind of uh, storage units on his back that they could sort of uh, live in and uh, or stay stored in. Uh, for colors, I was doing some really unexpected weirdness. Um, yeesh. Uh, really making it tough for myself going with <clears throat> like neon yellows and purples and blues. But I wanted her to pop out. I wanted to do something unlike anything that I'd ever done before. And I think it's fair to say this is not really much like anything I'd ever done before. Except for the last painting where I did a girl with green hair. But that was Tara from Final Fantasy VI. And that's just what her character design is. But anyways, green worked really well with the uh, kind of blues and uh, grays that I was kind of jamming and, and vibing with uh, for the big guy, the beekeeper in the back. So uh, it made sense to have her with green hair. It also tied the characters together a little bit more by uh, by including the, uh, the the same kind of color theme across the board, but having her with a bit more saturation. And later, I think she gets a little bit more like a, a purple or a, a dark, um, like a blood red kind of a, a color uh, going throughout, which I think also actually had good color harmony and it, it gets saved later although like color is not my strength um, it's something that I sort of struggle through I was trying a bunch of different brushes here you can see me kind of playing around with some of the more textured brushes uh, this is this is the point at which by the way uh, when I started working with color was when I uh, I switched to my MacBook if you can tell like the user interface got a little bit uh, smaller or bigger actually because uh, the screen got smaller um, and uh, and I was just kind of playing around with different uh, possible ways to add color. Like I said, it was this was very unfamiliar to me. I had never used uh, Sketchbook Pro to take a piece to final before, and uh, and I had only used it like really in a cursory manner, just like introductory manner, uh, just doing like little doodles and sketches. Um, so working with color with Sketchbook Pro was. Uh, really unfamiliar territory for me and I had to really discover and try a bunch of new things and and one thing as I've mentioned before about this channel is like I want to have uh, the whole you know uh, nuts and bolts you get to see like how it's made and, and how uh, even like it's not super glamorous you know you, you get to see my mistakes uh, so the uh, the way that I ended up doing the color uh, in in Sketchbook Pro is sort of similar to how I would normally do it using Photoshop or, or Corel Painter um, just because that's what's familiar to me so what I would do is I created a, a multiply layer after I had all my line work done I created a new layer a multiply layer and uh, I had tried using the uh, Copic uh, marker kind of stuff but it was doing the multiply thing as I mentioned and so I, I just wasn't sure like I, I think that would work but uh, uh, in this case, I wanted to be a little bit more, I, I wanted to go with something that I, I was certain that I knew would work. So rather than explore something that I wasn't sure how it works exactly yet. Um, uh, and so what I ended up doing was creating a multiply layer and then just using the same uh, pencil kind of uh, uh, brush that I, I had been using throughout the whole thing to do the line art um, and laying in the colors that way. Um, you know, as you can also see, there's, some really funky colors going on <laughs> um and i'm not sure why i i did that I, I think i just wanted to get funky with it you know sometimes you got to take uh things that should not be together and smash them together um and that's how you invent new things um you know sometimes you want to take the uh and 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 it's honestly it's the biggest challenge of being a, a character designer or a environment designer is that sometimes your task is literally um, is I mean I don't know how else to explain this 
if you take a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and you say, I, I want that to be not a sandwich, I want that to be in a cone. Um, for instance, this is, this is going to sound totally ridiculous, but that's what it's like being a concept artist, except minus the food. Um, <laughs> sometimes you're literally trying to make a chair that is also, that is not a chair. It's, it's something else. And, and you're beating your head against the wall trying to figure out how the heck am I going to get the functionality of this one thing that the client wants or that, that we need for gameplay, but it's not that, it's not that obvious thing. It's not just a chair. It's something else. It's something more inventive. It's something more, um, uh, you know, original. And that's honestly like, you know, you watch me do a drawing like this, but the truth about being a, a concept artist is that many times you would, if I were doing this for a client, there's no way that they would go with the first design that I did. This is super glamorous in that way. Like, uh, I've, I, I think when I first started working in games, uh, you know, in the PlayStation 2 or Game Boy Advance era, yeah, your first take was fine. You know, they would use that. But uh, nowadays, everything goes through iterations. And, and what that means is, it's like, what it means is essentially that your first idea that you try to do is never right. It's never going to be okay. It's never going to be good enough. Never. Unless if you're, maybe if you're, if, if the client comes to you and they hire you because of your taste and they already know what they, what to expect. Um, so these kind of things are a pure joy just to be able to have the freedom to design it the way that I would like to design it. And even then my iterative nature, because I've been doing, you know, concept art for games for uh, about 12 years. Um, you know, I, I still would like to go in even as I'm recording the audio for this after I've already finished the piece, I'd love to go in and change things and fix it and alter it and maybe do a different version where he's got a different kind of a gun on his arm or, uh, you know, more functionality to it or, or just little hits of detail or, or added on accessories or alternate tubing kind of things. Um, and it's infinite. It never ends. Somebody asked me and in one of the comments, they were asking me, uh, Hey, uh, I want to be a, want to be a concept artist. Do you think that that job will still exist in 10 years? And, uh, that's like saying, do you think we'll ever need ideas again? Are all the ideas done? Um, no, no, man, not, uh, you know, uh, Da Vinci was actually, I, I think of him more, more as a concept artist than anything else. When they had a problem with, uh, with trying to figure out how to reroute the water through a city, they called Da Vinci. Um, and he invented something that had real world application, but he was using a foundation of science and, and, uh, for for his time and uh, understanding of physics and and real world practicality, um, and so that will always be the case. And as we go into more fantastic realms and more imaginative universes, we're going to need world builders. We're always going to need world builders. We're always going to need creative people. And uh, a concept artist is not somebody who just does drawings. A concept artist is somebody who thinks about the future that, that thinks about how things are constructed and imagines how they're constructed and then tries to communicate that through visuals. That's what, that's what a concept artist is. A concept artist is not somebody who can paint like Rembrandt or paint like, uh, you know, photorealistic. Uh, that's not what concept art is. Uh, concept art is something, um, far, far more, um, uh, rich when you get into it on the surface level. Yes, it is. It's pretty pictures. But uh, beneath all that, there's so much more to it. Anyway, let's get back to uh, talking about Sketchbook Pro. Um, ultimately, uh, you know, I was kind of digging on uh, that one brush that I had found. So I just started kind of like playing around with it um, all over the place. And uh, uh, after I had sort of found my colors that I wanted and, and uh, found like my light that I basically kind of wanted to have, then I just started kind of playing around with like creating a new layer and then laying down some uh, rim light, which is kind of like that hard uh, kind of uh, blue that you see coming up from the left side. And then erasing that out. And then um, color blending. There's some neat blending uh, 
tools in uh, in Sketchbook Pro that I had discovered uh, using some airbrush there. And uh, yeah, so I started like just kind of blending colors together and it's kind of neat. It's got a little bit of that kind of uh, feel that you get when you're using uh, Corel Painter. Um, but then it's got, uh, I did a little bit of color balance adjustments. Um, and you know, once you have once you have uh, your colors in place, it's really like just blending. One guy that I know um, that does a lot of the um, the uh, splash Im images that you see for League of Legends, uh, his process is that he just kind of lays down chunky colors, and then he spends most of his time with blending tools. And uh, uh, Sketchbook Pro actually has some really great blending tools. Um, they're sort of like uh, these, these uh, it's more of a, it's almost like a dry brush kind of uh, effect, if you're familiar with that using, if you use uh, traditional uh, um, mediums, then you're probably familiar with like a dry brush approach. Um, and uh, Sketchbook Pro is really good for that. Uh, as, yeah, as you can see, I'm like digging into, I'm, I kind of went with this. Uh, so there was one brush that I really liked, and that was uh, this, I guess you'd say it's like a mechanical pencil, um, but then I adjusted it so that it's similar to my hard round brush that I would use in Photoshop, which essentially allows you to have a, you're adjusting the size using the brackets, and uh, and and then as you're lightly pressing, you're only barely uh, impacting the color, but then if you press harder, uh, you're getting more opaque, you're getting more opacity with it. And so uh, that's a really familiar brush for me. And I ended up doing, I would say, gosh, towards the end of this painting, I would say I did this last like 30% of it. And I did do a little bit of uh, 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 Martha Stewart on this in the sense that like I had, I had kind of like baked it a little bit. And then, uh, you know, you, you kinda, <laughs> I kind of skipped a, a little scene uh, just because it was like very tedious, uh, a lot of time-consuming, boring stuff to watch. Uh, the total drawing time, hmm, uh, due to some unfamiliarity with the software, uh, you know, I didn't have my quick keys like I'm used to, um, you know, it, I think it ended up taking me about 16, now 18 hours, um, which is, uh, you know, a little slower than my usual pace, but, uh, I think that's because uh, there's a lot of new stuff going on. You know, there's a lot of exploring going on. There were a lot of things that I tried that didn't work. And um, you can't really look at how long something takes you if it's a personal piece. You know, just it should just feel like, hey, this is kind of like a zone. This is where I'm comfortable. This is where I'm having fun. And you should feel free to, like, just kind of run with that and be in, in a comfort zone for your personal work. When you start working professionally, um, if, if you're a professional and you're listening to this, uh, then you should have probably, you probably have shaken your head when you hear me say that, um, <laughs> in a professional environment, time is very important. Um, there've been, I've had some clients that were, you know, very pressed on the schedule and that's usually a budget constraint, um, because I do charge hourly. Um, and it's totally reasonable. Um, you know, I, I think that sometimes people are amazed to find that I'm not as fast as I as I seem like I am. Of course, these videos are sped up dramatically. Uh, but anyways, um, so there you have it, guys. That's uh, that's my uh, that's my painting done all in Sketchbook Pro. Um, I really hope that you enjoyed this one. It's a pleasure to do some sci-fi. And, uh, you know, I always love hearing your feedback. You know, if you guys, uh, if you like certain aspects of it, you know, that's, that's cool. Like drop it in the, the comments. Um, you know, what's your favorite, what's your favorite sci-fi artist? Who's your favorite sci-fi artist? You know, I'd love to hear, uh, some of your guys' favorites. I was talking to my wife about this recently. I'm such a sucker for sci-fi. As soon as I see a ship flying into, like if I'm watching a movie trailer, if I see a, like a ship flying towards like a planet, I'm sold. I don't even care if the movie's bad. I'm going to see that. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so this was an absolute pleasure. And uh, hopefully someday I'll get to do a series of paintings uh, similarly of more weird space stuff. So please subscribe if you want to check out that stuff. And uh, swing on by down to uh, Autodesk Sketchbook. Pro, I don't know what their website is. I'll put it in the, the 
the text beneath the video. Check out uh, Sketchbook Pro if you're a student or you're an old pro, you've been doing this a while. It's an absolute delight to sketch with and uh, I want to thank you guys. Um, you know, most importantly, I want to thank you for checking out my videos. Uh, really appreciate it and so encouraging. Uh, thanks for stopping by. I'll see you guys in the next video. All right, ciao.